Hi, welcome to part 1 of the video series about physical quantities. In this video, we will do introduction to physical quantities by defining scalars and vectors. Then, we are going to identify which physical quantities are scalars and which ones are vectors. Finally, we will have a look at three multiple choice questions to see what type of questions can be asked in a caps aligned exams. Without any further delay, let's start to the topic. There are two types of physical quantities. Scalars are quantities which have a magnitude but no direction. Don't let word magnitude scare you. It's just a fancy way of saying a numeric value. For example, the phrase there are 20 learners in the class is self-explanatory. 20 in this phrase is a numeric value or magnitude and we don't need to specify any direction for these learners. Another example can be amount of money we have. We don't need to specify any direction to say that we have 25 rand to spend in a tuck shop. Of course, if you have buried a treasure and has a map showing its location, direction will be important. But we don't need it in a tuck shop case. Running 5 kilometers each morning is enough to express that we are trying to have a healthy style of life and we don't need to specify in which direction we are running. As a result, we can say that number of learners in a class, amount of money we have or a distance we cover each morning are scalar quantities. We can express them without mentioning any direction. On the other hand, sometimes we will not be able to express ourselves clearly without mentioning numeric value and direction together. And this is when we will use vectors to do so. Vectors are physical quantities which have both magnitude or numeric value and direction. It can be difficult to understand this definition without an example. So, let's assume that the image on the screen is our house and someone has asked where our school is located. As an answer, we say it's 2 kilometers away from our house. Can you locate where the school is? We can measure a distance of 2 kilometers to locate the school. But are we sure that we have located the school correctly? What if instead of drawing line to the east, we draw it to the west? Which of these two positions is the actual position of the school? What about school being north of the house? Or maybe it is to the south? In reality, our school may be located at any point on this circle, as each of these points is 2 kilometers away from our house. As you can see, we can't define a position of an object without specifying its direction as well, which means position is a vector quantity. On the screen, we can see the most common physical quantities. Maybe we don't recognize most of them yet, but we will learn about them in the upcoming videos. We don't have to memorize them, but it will be good to do so, as they are going to appear in our exam questions. Speaking about the exam questions, Let's see what kind of questions we can expect about this topic. Question 1. Which one of the following has both magnitude and direction? A. Scalar B. Vector C. Mass D. Time This one must be quite easy to answer as the question is the definition of a vector. So the answer is B. Second question, which one of the following pairs of physical quantities consists of one scalar and one vector quantity? A. Mass and time B. Acceleration and displacement C. Force and weight D. Speed and velocity Mass and time in option A are both scalar quantities. As a contrast, Acceleration and displacement in option B are 
both vector quantities. Same can be said about force and weight in option C. In option D, we have speed as a scalar quantity and velocity as a vector quantity. So, D is our answer. Third and the last question. Which one of the following combinations includes two scalar and one vector quantity? A. Mass, weight and time. B. Acceleration, distance and displacement. C. Force, weight and velocity. D. Speed, velocity and momentum. In option B, acceleration and displacement are vectors and distance is a scalar. So we have two vector and one scalar quantity. In option C, all three force, weight and velocity are vectors. Option D has speed as a scalar and velocity and momentum as vector quantities. So again, we have two vector and one scalar quantity. The only option which has two scalars, mass and time, and one vector, which is weight, is option A. As you can see, it may be very useful to memorize the list of scale and vectors from the previous slide. Of course, in the future, we are going to learn more about most of these quantities, and it will become much easier to solve these kind of questions. To represent a vector, we are using an arrow. Direction of the arrow is the direction of the vector. The length of a vector reflects its magnitude. The vector on the right side is longer than the one on the left, which means it has greater magnitude. The starting point of a vector is known as tail. And the end point is known as head. We use letters like A, B, F, and so on to name a vector. There are different methods to describe a direction of a vector. In this video, we will learn three of them. First, and the simplest one, is relative direction. Direction of a vector may be to the right, to the left, upwards or downwards. Using compass is another way of representing a direction of a vector. Instead of right, left and so on, we can use east, west, north or south. Sometimes vector will not point to any of the main compass directions. In this case, we can use an angle. To express direction of a vector, we need to measure the angle from one of the main compass directions. The angle we measure is 50 degrees to the north from the east direction. So, we can simply say the angle for this vector is 50 degrees north of east. We can follow similar steps for the following vector as well. The angle between the waist and the vector is measured as 40 degrees. As a result, we can define the direction of this vector as 40 degrees south of west. Third method of representing a direction is bearing. A bearing is a direction relative to a fixed point. Given just an angle, the convention is to define the angle clockwise with respect to north. Let's see some examples. To draw a vector of bearing 62 degrees, we measure 62 degrees from the north and then draw the vector itself. We follow the same steps to draw a vector of bearing 113 degrees. First. We measure an angle of 113 degrees respect to north and then the vector itself. By repeating the steps from the previous examples, 
Vi kan dra med vikten av pilen på 224 degrees. And a vector of peeling of 287 degrees. If two vectors have same magnitude and direction, they are equal. As you can see in these examples, each pair of vectors on the screen have the same length and direction. So each pair consists of equal vectors. For all three examples, f1 is equal to f2. If either magnitude or directions of two vectors are not same, these vectors are not equal. In the first example, directions of two vectors are same, but the second one is longer than the first one. In the second example, even though lengths, magnitudes of these vectors are same, their directions are different to each other. In the last example, neither magnitude nor directions are same. As a result, none of these vector pairs consist of equal vectors. A vector is negative of another one if they have exactly same magnitude but opposite in direction. This is the case for each vector pairs on the screen. Let's have a look to vectors which are not opposite to each other. In the first example, even though directions are opposite to each other, magnitudes of vectors are different. In the second example, their magnitudes are same but their directions are same as well. In the third example, their magnitudes are different, but directions are also not opposite to each other. As a result, none of these vector pairs are negative of each other. By the way, it's up to us to choose which direction is positive and which direction is negative. By convention, on a horizontal axis right direction, and on a vertical one, upward direction are accepted as positive. But again, we can decide to choose left as positive and right as negative. In the final part of this video, we will learn how to multiply a vector by a scalar. Multiplying a vector by a scalar means multiplying its magnitude by that scalar. If the scalar is a positive number, the direction of the new vector will remain same. If the scalar is a negative number, the direction of the new vector will be opposite to the original vector. It will be difficult to understand the statements above without seeing them in action. Let's assume that we have a vector A, which has length of 4 units. Multiplying it by 2 means drawing a vector with a length of 8 units as 2 times 4 is equal to 8. We can multiply a vector by a negative number as well. If we multiply 4 by minus 1, we will get minus 4. As we learned in the previous slide, negative of a vector means vector of same length but in opposite direction. So as a result, we have a vector which is 4 units long but points to the left. If we multiply vector by minus 2, we will get a vector of 8 units. 2 times 4 is 8, which is also pointing to the left due to the minus sign in front of it. Not only integers, but scalars can also be real or decimal numbers as well. Multiplying a vector by 1 over 2 or 0, 0,5 will halve its length. If we multiply a vector a with negative 5 over 2 or negative 2.5, the length will become 10 units as 2.5 times 4 is equal to 10, but direction will be leftwards. Adding vectors in the same direction. It will be easier to explain it by using an example. Calculate the resultant force applied on the object in the figure. There are two forces applied on this object. 
The first one is 6 newtons and the second one is 9 newtons and both are to the right, meaning they are in the same direction. We can start to solve the equation by defining resultant force or resultant vector. The resultant vector is the single vector whose effect is the same as the individual vectors acting together. For this specific question, we need to find out a single vector which will have same effect as the two vectors in the figure. To calculate it, we draw the first vector and from its end, we draw the second one. The resultant vector will have the same length and direction as both vectors together. We can replace two vectors with a single vector pointing to the right with magnitude of 15 newtons. The second case is adding two vectors opposite to each other. The question is, calculate the resultant force applied on the object in the figure. Again, we have two forces of magnitudes of 6 and 9 newtons. But now, one of them is to the left and the other one is to the right. We can take the first vector and add the second vector on it. It's easy to see from the diagram that the resultant vector will be 3 newtons to the right. Even though the solution is correct, it is not a method we use in an exam or test. The required method is same as for addition of vectors in the same direction. First, we draw one of the vectors, then from its end or head, we are drawing the second one. The resultant is the vector combining the tail of the first one with the head of the last one. It is 3 newtons to the right. Now we are going to learn two methods to add vectors which are not in the same or opposite direction. In other words, which are not parallel. The name of the first one is tail to tail method. The name of the method gives us hint about the steps we must take. First, we draw two vectors by bringing their tails together. Then, from the heads of each vector, we draw parallel to the other one. As a result, we are getting a parallelogram shape. The resultant vector will be a diagonal combining the tails of two vectors and the connection point of two parallel lines. Let's try to use same method again on two vectors in this figure. If you follow the same steps, first we draw the vectors by joining their tails to each other. Then we complete the parallelogram by drawing lines parallel to both vectors. Finally, the resultant vector is the diagonal of this parallelogram. Another method of adding two vectors which are not parallel is tail to head method. Or in some textbooks, you can see it as head to tail method. In this method, we start addition by drawing one of these vectors. Then, as mentioned in the name of the method, we draw the next vector by joining its tail with the head of the previous one. Resultant vector is drawn starting from the tail of the first one and ending at the head of the last one. Unlike tail to tail method, we can add more than two vectors by using tail to head method. In this example, we will try to add three vectors shown in the figure. It's not important in which order we are adding vectors. We know from the maths that, for example, 3 plus 5 is equal to 5 plus 3, or 1 plus 2 plus 3 is equal to 3 plus 1 plus 2. Same is applicable for the addition of the vectors. For this specific example, we can start to solve the question by drawing the vector on the right. Then, starting from its head, we draw the second vector. Afterwards, we draw the last vector from the head of the second one. To summarize, we draw each vector from the head of the previous one. The resultant is the vector drawn from the tail of the first one to the head of the last one. On the last part of this video, we will learn how to add two vectors which are perpendicular to each other. The question is, 
Calculate the magnitude of the resultant of the two vectors in the figure. If the magnitude of vector A is 5 and magnitude of vector B is 12 meters. To solve the question, we can use either of the methods we have learned before. In tail to head method, first we drop the vector A and from its head we are drawing the vector B. The resultant vector is the vector starting at tail of A and ending at head of B. In tail to tail method, we draw both vectors by combining their tails. Then we draw parallels to each of them. And finally, the resultant will be a diagonal starting from the tails of two vectors. In both cases, we have a right triangle with A and B as its sides and resultant as its hypotenuse. According to Pythagoras theorem, square of a hypotenuse of a right triangle is equal to the sum of squares of two sides. In other words, C square is equal to A square plus B square. We can apply this theorem in our question to calculate the resultant vector. Square of the resultant vector is equal to A square plus B square. After substituting A and B, R square is equal to 5 square plus 12 square. If R square is equal to 169, R is equal to 13 meters. As we learned in the previous lesson, we can add any two vectors to get a single vector which has the same effect as the previous two. In the example on the screen, we are adding two perpendicular vectors A and B and get a resultant vector R. We do it by using the tail to tail method. Of course, we could easily use tail to head method as well. If we can combine two vectors to get a single one, we can reverse the process and split a single vector into two. To do so, we draw the single vector. Then, starting from its head, we are drawing parallels to x-axis and y-axis. Finally, we draw two vectors starting from the tail of the resultant and ending at respective parallel lines. As you can see, we are getting exactly same diagram as the one on the left. Let's redraw the diagram again, but now instead of naming the two vectors as A and B, we will name the horizontal one as Rx and the vertical one as Ry. These two vectors which were derived from one single vector are called components of the original vector. And the process itself is called resolving of a vector into its components. There is a reason in splitting a vector into two components which are perpendicular to each other. Let's resolve vector A into its components by repeating the steps we learned before. We draw two parallel lines starting from the head of vector A and then starting from its tail we draw vectors AX and AY. In this diagram we can see addition of two vectors by using tail to tail method. Now let's replace it by tail to head method. To do so the only thing we need to do is instead of drawing AY starting from the tail of AX we draw it starting from the head of AX. Doing so will leave us with a diagram consisting of a right triangle. Before proceeding with the components of the vector, let's change our focus to maths and do some revision about basic functions in trigonometry. On the screen, we have a right triangle with A and B as its sides, C as hypotenuse, and alpha and theta as angles. As we know, sine of an angle is equal to the ratio of a side opposite to it to hypotenuse. For angle of theta, sine theta is equal to b over c. Rearranging the equation to b is equal to c times sine theta, 
will help us in calculating the length of side B in case that hypotenuse and the angle theta have been provided. Cosine of an angle in a right triangle is equal to the ratio of an adjacent side to the hypotenuse. So, cosine of theta will be equal to A over C. Again, we can rearrange the equation to A is equal to C times cosine theta. Now, we can switch back to components of vectors and use the trigonometric equations to calculate magnitudes of AX and AY. AY is the angle opposite to theta. So, its magnitude will be equal to hypotenuse, which is the magnitude of vector A in this case, multiplied by sine theta. AX is adjacent to angle theta. So, its magnitude will be equal to A times cosine theta. It's enough time to see all this knowledge in action. We are given two vectors, each with a magnitude of 20 newtons. Vector A makes an angle of 20 degrees with the horizontal. And vector B makes an angle of 40 degrees. The task is to add these two vectors. Of course, we can easily manage it by using tail to head method. First, we will draw the vector A. Then, starting from its head, we will draw the vector B. The resultant vector is the vector starting at tail of A and ending at head of B. We have managed to draw the resultant vector, but it will be very difficult for us to calculate its magnitude and direction in this case. The task could be much easier if these two vectors were parallel to each other or perpendicular. Is there a way to achieve this? We can resolve each of these vectors into their components. Vector A to AX and AY and Vector B to BX and BY. Now we can do some rearrangement of vectors to clarify the diagram. As a result, we have two vectors AX and BX on horizontal axis and two vectors AY and BY on a vertical axis. Let's resolve the resultant vector into its components too. Now we have Rx and Ry. As we can see, Rx is equal to Ax plus Bx, as well as Ry is equal to Ay plus By. As we remember from the previous slide, once the components are known, we can use Pythagoras theorem to calculate the magnitude of the resultant vector. After so much theory, it's time to do some calculation. First, we can calculate x component of vector A. x axis is adjacent to 20 degrees. So, Ax is equal to A times cosine 20. The result is 18.79 newtons to the right. Y axis is opposite to the angle of 20 degrees. So, Ay is equal to A times sine 20, which is 6,84 newtons upwards. Similarly, we can calculate Bx and By. Bx is equal to B times cosine 40, which is 15.42 newtons to the right. By is equal to B times sine 40, which is 12.86 newtons upwards. Now we can calculate Rx and Ry. Rx is the sum of Ax and Bx. 18.79 plus 15.32 is equal to 34.11 newtons to the right. Ry is equal to the sum of Ay and By. 6.84 plus 12.86 is equal to 19.7 newtons upwards. At the end, we use Pythagoras theorem to calculate the magnitude of the resultant vector. R square is equal to Rx square plus Ry square. 34.11 square plus 19.7 square. After solving this equation, 
resultant is equal to 39.39 newtons. For all of the vectors above, not only we had calculated magnitudes, we have mentioned their directions as well. What about the resultant vector? We can't just simply say it is to the right or it's upwards or it's to the left or downwards. To specify its direction, we need to specify an angle on our diagram and then calculate that angle. To do so, once more, we ask for help from the trigonometry. We know that tangent of an angle is equal to the ratio of the opposite side over adjacent side. In this case, theta will be equal to inverse tangent of opposite side over adjacent side. The opposite side is 19.7 units and the adjacent side is 31.11 units. As a result, theta will be equal to 30.11 degrees. So, the resultant vector has 39.39 newtons as a magnitude and 30.01 degrees as a direction. It must be difficult to understand from the first shot. So, let's see another example. We are given three vectors and asked to calculate their resultant. This time, we will straight start with calculating components. First, let's calculate all horizontal components. F1x is equal to 25 times cosine 46, which is 17.37 newtons to the right. F2x is equal to 40 times cosine 32, which is 33.92 newtons to the left. F3x is equal to 34 times sine 23, which is 13.28 newtons to the left. As you noticed, for F3x, we used sine instead of cosine. The reason for it is that F3x is not adjacent, but opposite to the angle of 23 degrees. Rx is equal to the sum of all horizontal components, but there is trick here. Unlike the previous question, in this one, components of vectors are in various directions. So we have to decide which direction we will consider as positive and which one as a negative. For horizontal axis, we choose right as the positive and left as the negative direction. In this case, only direction of F1x will be positive. Directions of F2x and F3x will be negative. As a result, Rx is equal to 17.37 minus 33.92 minus 13.28. Rx is equal to minus 29.83. Due to the minus sign, we can say that Rx is 29.83 newtons to the left. Now, let's work on y-axis. F1y is 25 times sine 46, which is equal to 17.98 newtons upwards. F2y is 40 times sine 32, which is 21.2 newtons upwards. Y-axis is adjacent to 23 degrees in case of F3. In this case, F3y is equal to 31.3 newton downwards. Ry is equal to the sum of all y components. For vertical axis, we choose upwards as positive and downwards as negative. In this case, F1y and F2y will have positive values and F3y will have negative value. So, Ry is equal to 17.98 plus 21.2 minus 31.3, which is equal to 7.88 newtons. The result is positive, which means direction of Ry is upwards, as we have chosen upwards as a positive direction. Now, let's use tail to head method to calculate the resultant vector. We draw our x to the left. Then from its head, we draw our y. The resultant will start from the tail of our x and end at the head of our y. 
We use Pythagoras theorem to calculate the magnitude of the resultant vector. R square is equal to negative 29.83 square plus 7.88 square. If we solve this equation for R, it will be equal to 30.85 newtons. Finally, let's calculate the direction of the resultant vector. First, we specify which angle we will use as direction. Then, we can use inverse of tangent function with Ry as numerator and Rx as denominator. The angle of the resultant vector is equal to 14.8 degrees. Thank you for watching the video. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications if you don't want to miss my other videos.